Um, Zoo cycle, big red but, junkies get sued by college yeah. football players. <laughs> Dylan Rattle is like, I never cared about my name, image, and likeness on a small time podcast, but if you're going to keep that shit in, you're paying me, bitch. <laughs> Big Red Junkies. Day by day, day by day, he gets better and better. 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 Old man, woman, and child, he just turned this stadium inside out. It is spring football, gentlemen. It's spring football. We got Elijah Horrible here from uh, Herd at Sports Radio in the afternoons. Hail Varsity, Hail Varsity Radio. Radio. I'm sorry. I, I do, sorry. I do, I do double duty sometimes. It's Herd at in the morning. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and again, you can check that out. I did a terrible job of introing myself in the first episode we did together. It felt, felt like it was weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Hail Varsity Radio. It runs daily from 4 to 6. That's Monday through Friday, pretty much. If you're in the eastern half of the state, you can catch us. Uh, in Lincoln, we're on on 1240 KFOR. In Omaha, on ESPN 590. On uh, Columbus, we're on News Talk 900. And then in Kearney Hastings, Grand Island, we're on the ESPN Superstation 1440. So a whole bunch of places that you can catch us. Uh, we really appreciate everybody who tunes in. And yeah, 4 to 6 daily. And then we also have a special Saturday morning show that runs from 745-ish until 9 15 ish every saturday morning no commercials that way <laughs> uh no commercials no censorship we have uh, brandon vogel gary sharp on every single saturday morning that's become a pretty popular show it's for good us. content yeah and uh nobody else really does anything on saturday morning so if uh, you wake up on a saturday morning with nothing to do check it out hail varsity radio you can find that the hail varsity youtube page where you can also find every single show that we do so there's the, the plug for myself because i kind of skipped right through the first it. one i was excited to talk football excited to talk huskers hell yeah it's my life we're sitting here just for a frame of reference because this isn't going to come out this weekend. But we're sitting here watching Creighton uh, hopefully lose to Tennessee. Mm. Um, spring training started. Spring practices started. Um, I felt like it kind of snuck up on us because of all the Trev stuff. It was like, oh, well, by the way, we're practicing this week. It's exciting. I think that it's been really cool. I mean, weirdly juiceless though, right? It's compared to the average spring. Yeah. Yes and no. I can't really say that because you're getting so like we get so much from rule and so much media access and all this like we've never had this before anybody from from anybody before rule and you also have to combine it with something we talked about last episode all the drama with trev the, yeah. the oscar basketball team making the ncaa tournament yeah, I've, that's what I've, i mean there's actually other stuff to talk about I've, I've talked about this with like my friends over the past couple weeks where it's just like march is always the time for me where it's like kick my feet up and like oh my god what are we gonna talk about on the radio show today yeah. there's nothing until spring practice starts it was not like that this year march yeah. was a whirlwind for husker media yeah. so i think there is also just the element of everyone wanting to take a deep breath and be like okay let's have a couple of quiet weeks for the spring game but it, yeah. it, it feels weirdly juiceless in that it always used to be like you're counting down spring practice is going to start we're going to get to see these new faces on the practice field hasn't felt like that this season um, even the excitement for Raiola, it's there, but I, but I, I was expecting been, more. He's been covered so much. He's been covered so much, and I think that he's doing the, you know, I, I was thinking about this actually when I was showering this morning. I was listening to Damon talk Just about it. thinking about Dylan Raiola in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to Damon and Robbie talk about him. But you might have to cut that out. That's going to get taken out for sure. you got to keep that uh, in. That's too funny. Do cycle, big red but, junkies get sued by college yeah. football players. <laughs> Dylan Rattle is like, I never cared about my name, image, and likeness on a small time podcast, but if you're gonna keep that shit in, you're paying, oh. man. Uh, but I, I feel like I feel like he's been covered so much, and Rule won't give us the. Yeah, he's the day one starter. Like he won't give us the juice. No. So I, th- I think people are ki- uh, kind of almost fatigued by the by the constantly talking about him and hearing about him because I feel like everybody and their mom is like. It's his job to lose. Right. He'd have to shit the bed in order to not be the be the starter. But every time Rule talks, every time Satterfield's talked, every time anybody's talked, it's oh yeah, well you know the two the two rookies, the two freshmen, they're doing really good. But you know Heiner Carberg, he's really putting in all this work and this. I'm like God. Well, I think there's a, a concerted effort because even when Thomas Fedoni got up and met with the media, he got asked about the freshman quarterbacks. Who does he go in on first? Heiner Carberg, and then Daniel Kalen. Yeah, and then he briefly talks about Ryle. I wonder if there's just and he an talked effort. about how they've got the the two freshmen have a great leader in Henrik Harburg. 
A, yeah. There's a great leader in that room, Hunter Carver. And I, I think every, I realized he was your roommate, man. I think Shut the fuck up. Everyone sees <laughs> the writing on the wall of that Dylan Rowell is going to start. And I think they're just trying to take some of the pressure off. Yeah, that could be. Concerted effort from the coaching staff, and we've seen this team. This team really echoes what the coaching staff believes. Yes. I think there's just a very team oriented message right now of this guy's a freshman. He's swimming in it. He's got to be a leader of an offense because we all know this guy, it's his job to lose. There's a lot of pressure on a guy like that. Why add extra pressure through the media? Why add extra pressure with even practice films of, oh, here's a Dylan Ryle throw. We've seen it in limited quantities, he, but he hasn't been treated differently than anybody else. We've seen Heinrich Harburg throws. We've seen Jack Walsh throws. We've seen Daniel Kalen throws. I just think there's an effort from the university to say, we're not going to put any more pressure on this kid than we need to because by the time August rolls around, he's going to have gonna all the pressure on yeah. the world. Yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You could be 100% right on that. I feel like, though, the, the way that Dylan Raiola has approached everything, especially when it comes to his recruitment, he doesn't seem to shy away from the pressure at all. He seems to love the spotlight. He loves. He seems to love the the idea that hey, yeah, I am a superstar. I'm here to be a superstar, and I think that I don't, I don't know. It's weird to me. He, he seems like when when you're when you're looking at some of the little reels and stuff like that that the university keeps putting out. They put one out. They dropped one out today that was um, of. You know, just some quick practice clips today, and I happen to notice just because of what Fedoni said, he goes, you know, I'm on the, I can't remember which team it was he said he was on, but I want to say the Bug Eaters. Oh, he's uh, on the, uh, for practice. He's right on now. the Rattlesnakes. The Rattlesnakes. Rattlesnake that's boys. Right. That's right. That's right. Uh, but they happen, you know, Rule didn't want to talk about who was playing with which team, but then you happen to see in their clip today that Raul was the one throwing at Fedoni. So then you have to assume he's getting the run with the ones. But at the same time, they could be rotating those guys all three in and out. You, you, you don't know. You, you could be running on the ones on Monday and with the twos on Tuesday. Like, Yeah. And, and it well, seems like... And I also don't know those teams are necessarily the ones, the twos, and the threes. At this point in the season, you've got to mix it up and see how guys respond. That's fair. Like, like we, did, we do know that as of practice on, was that Wednesday? The Rattlesnake boys won. Yeah. We know they, they won, they won their competition period, and Rilo <laughs> was the quarterback. We know that. We can read into that. But, like, I, spring football needs to be taken with what it is, which yeah. is practices. It practices is. are not 90,000. It's not Memorial Stadium. It's not a road game at the shoe at Ohio State. True. It's spring practice. I understand it's valuable. You can glean some information. But I think it's just you also have to step back. And I think there's kind of an understanding this year with just what I've seen in the first week that, you know what? It's practice. Yeah. These guys are using this time to get better. What happens now will affect how you play in the fall, but what happens now is not the be-all, end-all for the fall. Yeah. Well, the hype in, in the way that you just hear the players talk, because we've only heard two players talk since they started, obviously, Fedoni, and then I was shocked to see that it was Prohaska up there. Um, and he looked good. It's kind of concerning to see him still wearing two giant-ass metal knee braces as he's just stepping up for a press conference on the podium, but it is what it is. He wasn't sweaty like he'd just come in from practice. He was like, dressed like normal so I, I was like why is he wearing his deep braces right now but whatever um maybe he's coming from a pt or something you never know those things take a little bit to get on and off yeah i suppose he sleeps in them it's actually how his knees are connected <laughs> <laughs> he actually has no acls anymore <laughs> they're, they're permanent <laughs> the knee brace is his acl i i loved that rule was all business he almost had to look to him that it was already like mid-season <laughs> mid-season practicing there doesn't seem to be this dog and pony show like there was last year where it was you know we've got to get all this hype going none of these guys are really in line yet we've got to get all this stuff put together this is all very business like you know you saw you saw Fedoni get up there and just like you said before everything that all of the major players on the team are or anytime you hear them speak they sound just like all the coaches mm. all the coaches repeat the same stuff you could 100% be onto something with the they're trying to take pressure off Dylan Rayola I don't know well, I'll, I'll be really curious to see at what point does Dylan Rilo get up there and meet the media himself? That is, some, is it going to be at some point this spring? Is it going to be post spring game? Is kind of where my mind goes. That like, hey, he gets Probably. to play in the spring game and you get to stay up there in front of the media. But is it, it could be something you just wait till fall. And I, I think that can kind of be the sign to me of a how ready is a kid for that spotlight for that moment, and b how much pressure is he under. 
Yeah. You know, how much parts are they trying to take off of him? Yeah, as I say, it kind of depends on when they announce him as the starter, too. Oh, and it's not going to be this spring. Because no. it, if he's not your starter, why you're not going to have your backup quarterback go up there and talk to the media. So, But how are you going to run the spring game without at least looking to indicate that he's going to be the starter? All th- Those three quarterbacks are all going to get a significant amount of run time in the spring game. But, I mean, so. there's going to be a, an A-team running out there, and... Who is, who's like, are they going to throw Harburg out there just so that it's like, well, he's the most senior guy. I'm going to run him out. It's usually an A ish squad yeah. in the spring game. I get you there. Where you, you get well, a lot of the pieces, then you go, but you got a backup running back? The the <laughs> spring game is going to look different this more different this year than it did last year just because they have more pieces yeah, they can put out there. Players Remember last year sure. with the linemen the, that just the, played yeah. both ways yep. all game? Those poor guys. <laughs> Jesus Those Christ. Those poor guys, they, they needed They it. probably loved it too. I they mean, needed it. <laughs> They're probably exo- the spring game is like supposed to be. You talk to former players; it's like a celebr. We're done with spring. Yes. You get out there and just enjoy your Saturday. Like obviously, it's a scrimmage and it matters, but like the starters, like oh, you get your one quarter and then they're going to sit you on the bench the rest of the game. Those starting offensive linemen are out there for four quarters, <laughs> no breaks. You got to go to the they sideline literally for just a ran punt, sixty minutes and then back out there. Those dudes are probably gassed. What did you make of Prosca being the guy that took the podium today? Anything? I think it's a, a vote of confidence. I mean, Rule is is somewhat tactful with the guys he puts up there. It's not a coincidence that Jamal Banks is the guy that he throws up there pre-spring football, post-winter conditioning. Yep. Like He's trying to show the team, hey, what this guy's doing, what Jamal Banks is doing, he's an example. Yeah, we're going to talk about him in press conferences. We're going to throw him up there. And it, it could be similar with Prohaska. He's, it could also he's be, been slobbing all over Jamal Banks. Like it, since he got here. It could be a case of saying, hey, Teddy, you have, you were coming back from injury last year. You dealt with your fair, fair share of shit during the 2023 season. We really like how you've been working through winter conditioning. We like how you've attacked spring football to start. We're going to give you put you up there in front of the press as uh, something of a reward so everybody kind of knows it. Rule has various reasons for why he puts people up there. I don't like to read too far into it, but I do know if a guy's up there, it's not because he's doing things badly yeah. behind the scenes. No, I, didn't, I I thought it was interesting that he made a comment about his weight, and he's he's going to play smaller, and Rule made the comments about how Nash is going to play smaller. I'm like, are they just getting more nimble everywhere? Like, what's what's happening here? And you look at a guy that's had that many knee in- injuries and issues that he needs to was. play a little smaller. I mean, he was playing at, what, 335, 340 last year, just almost the same weight difference that Nash Hutmaker is going to do. I think it's an interesting look. I don't, I don't. I don't want to see Corcoran back out there at tackle, so I'm hoping that this means Corcoran's going to be available to play at guard like he was good the year before. Well, it's it's also, I think, at this time of year, that what the weights guys are at now is far from what they'll be come fall. You've made it through yeah, half but he of made your offseason. Frosca made the comment that the, his target play weight is going to be 312. Yeah, they, yeah. They yeah. already said that. But I'm saying, like, like there is obviously body reshaping that happens. Like, For sure. Like, just because it's 312 doesn't mean it's going to be... Uh, What's the best way to put it? Portly 312? I wonder why they decided to put that extra two pounds on there. Just say 310. <laughs> the, Dude, fuck? The, the way that the science and everything that they put into all this stuff, they're looking at what's ex- what exactly is optimal for these it, guys. It needs like, to be three, 312.4. That's, I, that's his actual I, optimal I, I, weight. I guess what I'm saying is goal weight is 312 now, but like midsummer rolls around. The guy's at 316. He feels good. Do you say, hey, true. we said 312. Like, I, it's not the be-all, end-all. Maybe those You're knee only braces feel better when he's at 312. Possible. <laughs> That's <laughs> what takes him back up to the 335. Like, hey, all, all, all your science can say, this guy's going to play better at 312. When he actually gets on the football field, does he feel more comfortable, right. more confident at 312? I guess that's what I'm saying in terms of we're still only halfway through off-season conditioning yeah. here. I'm I'm taking all well, that we're, we're a little bit. We're in week one of, of football activity. Yeah. I think it's cool to see him in the what do they what do they call them the egg crate helmets or whatever the 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 shells the pads yeah I think it's cool to see him in that and rule dress that specifically in the press conference he was asked about it he's like well I don't know we saw we saw the NFL was doing it and I asked about it they said it's safer so we're doing it <laughs> I don't have any problems with it some of the some of the questions that were asked I thought were pretty funny and I actually thought that the hut maker playing at a lower weight. I thought that was news that was breaking, especially the way that it was asked and the reaction you saw from the media guys. Jed pointed out, they actually made comment about that. His dad said it in that chasing three. Oh yeah, this is this is the plan from the start. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't have any idea on that. From what I understood was they were going to let him get small for wrestling and expect him to be back up there for football. Well, it was, uh, they had their own weight loss plan in mind before the wrestling. Really? 
Yeah, yeah. I didn't know about this. Well, they they talked about it in the the chasing three a little bit with with Tony White because they that How was the part of the conversation. Did I, miss this? Like, <laughs> I feel like I watched that in depth twice, and apparently I missed this. Yeah, t- Tony White mentioned it a little bit, being concerned about the weight loss, but then they kind of talked with the nutrition plan, and that was kind of their plan all along. Was we we Nash wanted to play a little smaller. The sports science people thought he could play a little smaller. Thought he might be a little more nimble, athletic, explosive that way. Uh, Knighton said kind of the same thing. So. I don't think they planned on getting him down to 285 and raising him back up, but the plan was always to have him be smaller for this upcoming season. That was one of the things they talked about at the end of the season as being something they thought could improve his game. What do you think about him wrestling? Matt loves it. I don't have a problem with it. Matt's a, Matt's a big fan. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was fun. The, well, just from the aspects of not only um, the, the uh, discipline that you need in a sport like wrestling, oh, yeah. but the impact that it has on your footwork and your handwork, and it, it's not a bad thing in my mind. I think it's fantastic. Oh, it's not not a bad... I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, it's going to completely change how Nash Hutmacher plays football. Like, I think it was one season of wrestling. You get it under your belt. You get to enjoy yourself through a weight loss period. Like, weight loss fucking sucks. Nobody likes to go on a diet and lose <laughs> 40 pounds. <laughs> he, he, did you hear his mom? He's like, well, now he's just eating three meals a day instead of six. <laughs> yeah, instead of eating eight meals for, or eight eggs for breakfast, he's only eating four. Yeah. And I'm like, I have two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but like, weight loss isn't fun. It's enjoy, like You have a fun reason behind it now. You're getting down to weight for wrestling. You got to yeah. have a competitive nature through your weight loss. You got to keep that competitive through the winter. I don't think it's a bad thing. I'm not going to like, I don't think it changes the game for Nash by any means. He's a high level wrestler coming into college. You get that, ex- that college experience uh, where you get to go do something you enjoy through a weight loss period. And Hey, it, it brought some juice to the football program. It-, it gave all his teammates something to cheer for brings them together a little bit. It's nothing but a good thing in my mind. I mean, obviously you can look at it. If a guy gets hurt during spring practice, that changes the conversation completely. Yeah. And you say, Oh, well, should he have been doing wrestling? Clearly, there was something going on that has now limited him in spring, and now he's got an injury. That, I think it, that remains I think it's to be cool seen. To hear, but, I think it's cool yeah. to hear that they're like, hey, your body's a little fatigued from wrestling. We don't want you out there running these drills like the rest of the guys. And he's like, fuck that. I want to be out there, man. Like, <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> Sounded like he was having a hard time with that already this week. He's 290 pounds. It's the most energy he's ever had. Yeah, probably. <laughs> he's feeling great. He's like, I want to run some gassers. Is there anybody or anything that you're really looking to looking to find out or see during the spring here? I'm really, really curious about the Husker rushing attack and what running back emerges. Because we all, I think a lot of people that watch this team closely think Dowdell fits the bill of a Big Ten running back. Does he step in and actually fill the shoes of a Big Ten three-down running back that you need? Is he able to get you the pass protection that you need in that case? How is he as a route runner? We don't really know that from his time during Oregon. I am just curious to see. It's not just the running backs, but the offensive line included the tight ends. What does the running game look like? And it's not a sexy answer because everyone wants to see what does Dylan Ryle look like in the spring game. I'm less concerned about that. That's a guy that's a freshman that's probably going to be swimming in the offense a little bit. He's going to not have a full grasp of what the offense as a whole is. One thing you can get installed really quickly, running attack. Are the running backs putting the ball on the ground? Are the offensive line opening up holes against a defense last year that we all know was stout against the run? That's like the main thing to me in spring football is, is Dylan Raiola going to have a rushing attack he can turn to in the fall to take pressure off of him? Because not only does the rushing attack take pressure off of him and what a freshman quarterback has to do, it takes pressure off the defense so he can run time off the clock. If you can pick up a couple first downs, it takes pressure off your special teams. Hey, it's not about flipping the field anymore. It's about let's pin him deep. And if it's touchback, it's a touchback, but takes pressure off them in that moment, punting from the 50 as opposed to your own 20. That's big on me because you can get your, your rushing attack with the offense alignment that you have coming back with the, the running backs that you have that obviously have to figure out the offense, but that's easier to do than a quarterback who has to know the role of every single person within the offense. You can get that going quicker. That's like the number one thing to me is what does that rushing attack look like with another year under Riola, the, with the marriage between Satterfield, what he wants to do, along with what Thomas wants to do. What does that look like? I think that is what will also uh, an item just that will be closer to completion by the end of spring than a lot of other areas within the football team. So, <clears throat> Do you think that as much peeling back the offense and as much holding everything down and manipulating it the way that they needed to last year in order to basically account for the lack of quarterback play that we had. 
you really think that they're going to throw everything in a bag of chips at Raiola out the gates and make it tough on him like that? Because I see, I see the way that Satterfield designs his offense as being very, very malleable in, in that they're going to play with what they have. And if Raiola is struggling and, they're, and he's the dude, I think they're going to pare it down for him. I think you're totally right when it, you're, you're hitting it on the head when it comes to the, the rushing attack being super important. I don't know that Dowdell's any more the guy than a healthy Irvin is. Emmett Johnson. Emmett he Johnson. Into year. Dude, if Emmett Johnson, if they can turn him into, like, I think of like a, a Deion Lewis type for the Patriots or a James White type for the Patriots, a guy who can rely or reliably catch the ball out of the backfield as much as. And, and kind of slip those coverages because he's a tiny dude that gets lost behind a ginormous lo- offensive line. Um, if he can turn himself into that type of a player and not just be the, oh, shit, we have no one else, uh, we're still going to do halfback dives here, but uh, you know if you, if you squeak, squirt through there, that's awesome. That's not going to surprise anybody next year. If, if he can turn himself into more of a third down back, I think he has no doubt a, a, a role in this from the get. I think he's just a hell of an athlete. Yes. I think he's a hell of an athlete. Don't ask him to jump over Matt Rule again, but I think he's a, <laughs> I think he's a, I think he's a hell of an athlete. I am not seeing what he's putting on the practice field every single day to be able to say this is what he needs to do. I mean, for all I know, it could be a a, a light a thunder and lightning type combination between Dowdell and, and Emmett Johnson, or maybe it's Irvin. Maybe Irvin's back from injury with a vengeance. I'm well, not, he already looks huge again, just like he did I'm not, off-season, last I'm not off-season. completely out on Irvin. I do have some doubts with a couple of lower body injuries. What can he return to? I don't know. And that, how, do you, that, how do you trust him? That, and, but that's why the question to me is, what does the rushing attack look like? Because there's a lot more question marks there and a lot more options there. Whenever you look at the passing attack, okay, uh, we know Jamal Banks probably going to be a starter. Malachi Coleman's going to have a piece. Jalen Lloyd's going to be a deep ball guy. We saw what Fedoni did last year as a, as a tight end, being able to get himself open and be able to make some big time catches and, and some, some, some big, big moments. Big drops. Also some big drops, but better as the year went on. But it's less of an unknown commodity. Yep. Less outside of Ryle and what he is as a quarterback. There's some unknown commodities within the rushing, within the rushing attack that I will be interested to see just in terms of like, who is going to emerge. Yep. Could, Emma Johnson could be your, your guy with another year of offseason development. He's still young. He could be the, the 1A guy, and I wouldn't be shocked. Could. So, he reminds me of Amir Abdullah a little bit. I get like a... Uh, Ooh, what's a comparison here? I'm just talking Nebraska comparison. Yeah, so I'm trying to think of the, the right Nebraska comparison. He definitely ain't Marlon Lucky. Pork chop? He ain't, that, he ain't that thick. I don't know. It's, uh, he's his own, maybe he's Emmett, he's just Emmett Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> he reminds me a lot of Emmett Johnson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that Emmett Johnson guy. Maybe we don't yeah. have to make a comparison. Yeah. I, I, the other thing that I absolutely love about Emmett Johnson is the fact that he's, he's another one of those guys that the first time I ever heard him talk last year, I was like, sounds exactly like he's been taking all of his talking points from Matt Rule. Yep. Like every, all the all the guys that Rule tends to fall in love with on the team, they all sound exactly like all the coaches. They all do. And they also tend to impress the most in the field. Yeah, not a coincidence. Well, they're they're the most bought in. They're the most bought. They're the most coachable. Yeah. What do you think the offensive line is going to look like this year? Well, it looks like we got Mizuka working left guard. That leaves Prohaska left tackle, Ben Scott center. Right guard's a little up in the air, and then I think we all have Ben Hart penciled in at right tackle. For sure. So I, I Barring I, injury, he's probably our, our best guy returning outside of Ben Scott. Yeah. Question to me, does Justin Evans Jenkins play right guard this year as he's the center in waiting? Do you want him to be working center in practice so he's ready to go as your number one guy next year? That's a question to me. The right guard spot is... Wasn't Corcoran playing one. some right guard? Before he moved out to left guard or that, left tackle, that last dude's year. been just thrown around his entire Husker career from tackle to guard, and back to tackle, and back to he guard. Was I feel so bad much for better him. as a guard though, dude. He was terrible at left at left tackle last year. I feel bad for him though because he's never gotten to settle in at a single position. He's That's never fair. he's never got to spend a spring and a fall working in one position. Do you think they're going to give him that this year? I hope so. Because if, it, if, if Prosky is healthy and he's good, then I don't know why you wouldn't. It's what a guy like Corcoran deserves. He deserves a year to actually put it all together and say, hey, this year, from winter conditioning to spring football to summer conditioning to fall camp through the season, I am a right guard, left guard, whatever it is. Yeah, He deserves that opportunity because he has been criticized more than probably any Husker lineman over the past four seasons. And it's not been... Especially last year. Look at his pro football focus grades for last year. 
it hasn't been it hasn't been <laughs> off place. Been, yeah, it hasn't been off place. Country. It's been worthy. They've been right. He's been bad, but yeah. some of that has been due to circumstances out of his control. And you know what? If he gets a winter and a spring and a summer and a fall working in the same position, he's still bad. I'll say, you know what, Turner Corcoran? I wish you would have been better. It didn't work out for you here. But I want to see he him. He wasn't bad two years ago at guard. He wasn't bad. Right. I, I want to see him with the opportunity to work that for a full year. What can you be? Because I'm not out on the Turner Corcoran experiment yet. A lot of people were out on Bryce Benhart. I was. I, oh, well, there was a joke all last year was me actually giving him praise because I was a Ben Hart he, he used to shit on him so bad. Oh, mm-hmm. God. It I'd, was, I'd love to him? see a Corker Redemption. We, we'd have whole episodes I, where PJ would just I, call I him to, any I used, name under the I used the sun to call Cam Jurgens Cam, not a center Jurgens. I just got his beef jerky, by the way. Pretty good, but continue. <laughs> I didn't know we've made <laughs> beef jerky. What? Yeah, jerky jerky. Shut the fuck up. No, what? I'm not kidding. Jerky jerky. Oh, my God. He's got okay. a hot honey flavor. It's delicious. I'll give it a go. Okay. I, I, I got the, uh, the little sampler. I tried all his flavors. This is a total Solid. sidebar, but this was... This lit the fuck out of Twitter for like a whole weekend. <laughs> when 1890 decided to team up with Piedmontese and Marcato and take on their jerky and brand it, uh, it pissed everybody and their mom off that is a Husk Guy's Twitter account supporter uh, because he does, they, they do I pipeline jerky. He, yeah. yeah, they do pipeline jerky. And everybody like threw this giant fucking fit. Oh, I can't believe they'd compete directly with them and this and that. And they're in a, they're already doing the NIL and this and that. I'm I like, knew there was so much I'm loyalty like, to beef jerky. Well, th- that was the funny thing was so many people were like, the market's so small for beef jerky. Why would they hoard in on this? <laughs> it's I'm like billions like, and billions fucking, of dollars. No, it's literally a five. I looked it up. It was like five point six billion dollars yeah. snack. In, like it's like the fourth largest snack item in the in the world. Yeah. A, like people are like, oh, there, you really think there's a lot of people out there buying beef jerky? Oh, I don't know. Is that why there's a whole fucking aisle in every gas station? <laughs> <laughs> it's all dedicated to beef jerky, and these people are the doing seven beef. different varieties of cracked pepper. You're like, yeah, yeah I'm like, I'm, so so I was laughing about that, but then I'm also like, personally, I'm a huge Piedmontese beef and Mercado like fan. Mm-hmm. I I will go spend the extra money to go buy their stuff because. It is light years ahead of everything else that you can buy around here, especially my, in that price range. My roommate's dad actually worked on the research project that studied the uh, the Belgian blue cattle and got the uh, the gene isolated to turn it into Piedmontese cattle. Small world. Jesus Christ, that's cool. Do you know who led the research? No, no idea. Ronnie Green. Really? Oh, Ronnie Green was the head of the research. My, huh. So my roommate's dad worked under him, and and who was the beneficiary of that uh, that research? The Pied family with Piedmontese beef. Yeah. And uh, who then becomes UNL Chancellor? Ronnie Green. So crazy. Small world. So crazy how that happens. Weird. You know, their names aren't on buildings or anything like that. Also, I think it's funny how it's peed Montese beef. Oh, yeah. But peed. anyway, back, back to the beef jerky. <laughs> like, not even hiding that one. I was already <laughs> buying their beef jerky the, at, at Mercado because they, they ran this 12 Days of Christmas special. And one of the 12 Days of Christmas was like, uh, buy one, get one free, or buy one, get two free bags of beef jerky. They're like eight or nine bucks a bag. And so we went in, and I went in and bought, like I was, I was there to buy steaks, but I saw this, and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to grab a couple of these. And I literally opened it up as I got back in the truck, took a bite, and I'm like, oh, fuck. And I gave, it, gave a bite to my wife, and I'm like, cool, we're headed to Christmas. Uh, these are going to be stocking stuffers. I went back inside and bought like $30 more worth of, worth of jerky and stuff, and... and uh, and that, so it ended up being like 10 more bags of jerky. And it was, it's, it's amazing jerky. And I got one bag, and I, I, I'm not going to torch them on this because I haven't, haven't tried it at all. But the pipeline jerky is not even comparable. Like, it's not, it's not good compared to this. And I'm, I'm watching all these people just throw this giant fit. I'm like, well, first of all, it's a better product. Second of all, the Pete family is also the largest donor to 1890. Why the fuck would they not be connected? Well, they, and they, this is a branding deal. It they, wasn't like they, they run 1890. Yeah, it, but it, but I'm saying it's like it's this is a branding deal. It wasn't like they came out and said, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna start up a beef jerky company." In <laughs> this is gonna be in all the concessions in the stadium yeah. next year. Yeah, I, and maybe it will be. Who knows? Again, you're listening to the Big Red Junkies Jerky Show. Here? Yes, um, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Last episode it was Japanese baseball. This episode yes. it's beef jerky. <laughs> You could tell it's off-season football talk. Yes. I, won't, I won't speak too much on the jerky because, again, it's off-season talk. I don't think it matters in the grand scheme of things. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the better product will rise to the top. Are we surprised that 1890 wants to be the be-all, end-all for NIL in Nebraska? You shouldn't be. 
No. Yeah, I, absolutely, they're upset if somebody else is taking NIL dollars from them because they work directly with the university. They control where the money goes. Like, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that they look at this opportunity and say, huh, we have an NIL, a competing NIL market. We support the same team, but they're taking dollars that could be going to us. Whenever we work directly with the university, we work directly with the football team, we work directly we, with the coaches, we already have decide all where those the money goes with. on our roster yeah. anyway. Yeah. It makes sense. PR wise, did they handle it great? Probably not. Yeah. Probably I don't not. Think they thought about it. No. It, it just seemed like, it, like who cares? We're, we're, we're putting our brand on some jerky. Exactly. Why are you upset? Exactly. And that's kind of the, the take I have is just like, everyone freaked out, but should we be surprised? Like, they do, like, 1890. If there was no 1890, Dylan Ryle is probably not in Nebraska. No. Like, is, like, the football team, does it have the talent? in the wings waiting to come up that it would have if 1890 wasn't around. No, like 1890 is a great university. Banks, we pull and half of those recruits. It's because they have a damn near monopoly over the NIL world. Yeah. And I don't think we should but be surprised that, that they want to, they want to continue yeah. their monopoly. Yeah, it's that way in every school. Exactly. Though. The majority of schools out there have one NIL program. That's dominating their, their, yeah. their entirety of it. You know, they talked about that for Kentucky, how Kentucky was uh, the, uh, what's his name? Calipari was like, "Yeah, we're gonna we're starting a basketball only NIL." Okay, well, your football program still generates a shit ton more revenue than your basketball team. Yes, your basketball program is renowned, you know all these things. Your football program is probably still dwarfing the basketball team by what? There may be ten percent of their generated revenue. It's, it's something we talked about last episode in the modern era of college athletics. If you don't have a football program, you don't have an athletic department. Yeah. So and they have a football program. So why are you trying to find them? I, yep. I don't get it. Enough on NIL. I don't I don't really have anything else on spring practice that I'm excited about other than the fact that it's happening. Yeah, and that's I think that is one of the healthiest Husker responses to spring football we've had in a long time. Yep, spring football's going on. We'll see what it looks like at the spring game. Yep. Wake me up when September starts. Yeah. Like <laughs> can it not be dramatic, please? Yep. No uh, major injuries. Keep the injuries off the field. Yeah, if there's no news that comes out of spring, I'll be very happy. I, I want to see some clips of Rylo slinging around at practice. Uh, I want to see Malachi Coleman running some deep routes and catching it in some hype video that the, the media team creates. And then I want to see it put on the field for two quarters in a spring game with the backups getting their time to sh- shine in front of their hometowns, in front of their families in the third and fourth quarter. If we can make it through that with no injuries and we can make it through spring and into a Husker baseball regional after that, no complaints from me. <laughs> through that, just slip that Husker baseball regional in there. Nice. It, like it should like, it never, it never they're, is. They're pretty good this year. It never is. But Husker basketball in, a, in the tournament, Husker baseball doing well in the Big Ten, hopefully angling for a regional, it should be bigger news than spring football. It never is. And sometimes people at work like look at me crazy when it's like, oh, like you're, you're umpiring a baseball game whenever the spring game's going on. I'm like, yeah, the spring game doesn't matter. It's like... <laughs> it's a practice. It's a practice. Jed, Jed will say the same thing. It's a practice that it just happens to be in front of 50,000 people. Like... It's it's it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. There are there little things you can glean from the spring game every time, like the nine fumbles last year. Sure. Are there little things you can glean? Yes. That should have been more foreshadowing. <laughs> yep. yeah. um, if there's if there's not a an improvement on the on the turnovers, at least in the spring game, I, I don't know. People are gonna lose their shit. They'll be rioting in the streets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think the spring game, at least this year is being taken in the way it should be, which is, this is a time for development. We'll see how it looks when the spring game comes around. If it looks bad, we won't overreact. If it looks great, we won't overreact. Obviously, there's going to be overreaction after the spring game. That's how it goes. But I think Husker fans generally have a more healthy way to approach approach spring football this year, and that's a good thing. I sure as fuck hope so, man. <laughs> uh, then April 27th is going to roll around, and it's going to be fucking batshit insane. There's going to be people <laughs> anointing Dylan Ryle is the next savior, and then other people saying, no, 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 it's just a spring game. You're overreacting. He's not even going to start this year. <laughs> yeah, he's going to come out and throw a bomb like that. Do you make anything of Malachi Coleman's injury that they're talking about? I was surprised to hear Rule basically say that he's not, not participating right now. No. I, th- I didn't even know he was injured. Apparently, he rolled his ankle up at some point. It, it's a need-to-know basis. If it was, We saw last year from Rule. During the season, it's a little different, I guess. But if it's an injury that's going to keep somebody out for a significant period of time, don't Matt Rule is pretty upfront with it. Yeah. So injuries happen. It's football. It's like the hip drop tackle. What are we doing? Hit injuries happen. It's football. Oh, there's a higher rate of injury on this tackle. 
It's a rate of injury on every single freaking tight How do you want people to tackle a tight end? That's an aside. JJ, end JJ Watt's response to that was, because we're only one more step away from belts with flags on them. <laughs> don't get it. They're like, oh, like three years ago, we need to lower the, the target zone for people tackling players. They need to wrap them up and bring them to the ground how you're taught to tackle. And then you wrap people up and bring them to the ground how you're taught to tackle. Like, well, we got to get rid of that too, because now it's leading to injuries. Well, they're saying they're saying that. Uh, well, and this is what I don't understand about this. And we're going off on a weird, another weird tangent. But they, they, uh, what's his Dean Blandino was explaining this on one of the ESPN shows. I can't remember, uh, but he was he was basically saying that the they're they're gonna have to meet three qualifications to call it a penalty. Yeah, and that this is gonna be probably more reviewed than pass interference was when they were doing the whole coaches can throw a flag to challenge pass interference calls mm -hmm. because it's gonna have to be three different things and like targeting. And part of that is that it's it's not necessarily how they grab them or where they grab them. It's what they do once they grab them and drop their weight. Roll and they have to wait. They have to drop their weight and roll or twist. Yep. And and if the if the if the uh, person being tackled has a clear space, it's kind of like the kind of like the landing area for NBA. If they have a place for their legs to come out and they're not getting rolled up on, then it's also not going to be a penalty. It's like. Why are you making this like you're just going to slow the game down even more? Well, as long as it's not like fourth and twenty in the AFC Championship game, and Patrick Mahomes gets tackled from behind while scrambling and Hip he gets a free tackle. first down, yeah. come, uh, the earlier parts are they're going to legislate this more through fines than on field flags, which I'd love. But at the end of the day, doing it off off the field completely that'd be awesome. The NFL seems to not grasp why people like the game of football. Yeah, it's a gladiator sport without death. Yeah, okay, that'd be like saying. Huh. Even almost death sometimes. Like, like what the NFL is doing right now would be like if boxing was like, you know what people really love? Bobbing and weaving like Floyd yeah. Mayweather. You know what people like? <laughs> Punches not yeah. landing. Like, yeah. no, people yeah. love Mike Tyson because he knocks people out. Yes. Like, people put up with Floyd Mayweather because he was great and he made a lot of money. He was elite at what he did. Nobody but understood like, him except for people who really understood boxing. Yeah, though. you had to be a boxing like connoisseur in order to really appreciate what he was doing. Like, pe like Everybody the, the understood NFL, Tyson. The NFL thinks that people watch the NFL <laughs> because of... People. It's Patrick Mahomes in the NFL and everyone wants to see points. No. People want to see inherent violence. Yeah. That is one thing I do like the fact that they switched the kickoff rule. That's going like their kickoffs are going to be way more. Exciting. It's going to lead to safer violence, safer violence, but it's going to be way like, I think it's going to lead to more scoring. Oh, yeah. You're going to, you're going to see probably three to four times the runbacks that you've seen in any recent time. As much as I hate the chiefs, they made one of the smartest signings I've ever seen getting that rugby guy in the international player pathway. Sure. Because do you know what kickoffs are going to look like? Rugby. I could see that. Where it's like... Be a hey, bit more of a scrum. Yeah, you got the whole field in front of you. You got a scrum in front of you. You got to pick one hole. You got to have a little more size on you because if you can break one arm tackle on these new kickoffs with everybody lined up within 10 yards of each other, one tackle might get you into open space. It's going to be a different game. You're going to have a lot more tight ends involved on kickoffs. You're going to have more running back types, bigger bodies that can break a tackle as opposed That's to just be as fast as you can to pick up 27 yards before you get hit. It's going to be much more about reading a hole, breaking a tackle, and getting free. That's why kickoffs going to be a lot Steelers more interesting. Signing Cordero Patterson, yep, huge that's dude. fucking huge. That's huge. He's too. a big, he's a big boy, and he can break tackles. Well, and one thing I said, he on already the, holds the record for the most runbacks. <laughs> one thing I said on Hale Varsity Radio this week, I'll be curious to see. I know we we had a long episode last time, so we should probably wrap this one up a little quicker. Is uh, that I am starting to think Matt Rule's over recruitment of tight ends in the past two cycles was calculated, knowing that might be coming to college football soon. Because what do you think would really benefit you on a kickoff return? Six, seven guys that are athletic, 260 pounds and can block. That sounds like the ultimate advantage to have on kickoffs. And Nebraska ran that kickoff in the spring game last year. Oh, yeah. He, he made reference to that in his press conference. And what is Nebraska brings in back-to-back -back recruiting classes with uh, what, what three tight ends? Yep. You, have, you have like seven tight ends on roster right yep. now. And the two, two or three that we're going after for this next one? You think about that, you might be able to just put tight ends out there as blockers on kickoff, and you go, oh, you'll have an advantage on everybody. Yep. I think, I mean, people yeah, have been, people yeah, have been like, the, I don't know if I'm willing to anoint that. I think that's Matt Rule teams, playing though, some. All you're going to see are fucking linebackers. Like, those, it's going to be the, the widest wingspans and the hardest hitting dudes. Yep. They can hit at a at a close range. Yeah. They don't have to have a running start. Yep. The, the days of the gunner, that shit's gone. Kickoffs? 
are going to be different and they're going to be a lot of fun. And I think Matt Rule might have been a little bit calculated in his recruiting strategy, understanding what the future of college football might be. I'll just throw that out there. It'd be fun. It'd be fun. Well, shit, man, it's always a pleasure having you on. We appreciate you taking the time. Time always flies by up here with you guys. Tell you what. <laughs> I remember last time we were here, I know it was two times ago. It was, it was but for a season preview. I didn't get out of here until like 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> oh, we, and I we wasn't also even mad did about like it. a three and a half hour show that. Yeah, it was awesome. It didn't feel like it. Yeah. it was. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I remember getting back into Lincoln at 2.30 in the morning being like, I have to work tomorrow, don't oh, I? <laughs> we'll get you out of here nice and early tonight. Creighton <laughs> hasn't even won this game yet. They might still lose. I mean, what are they down? Three at, at, at this commercial break? Four, I think. Four? So, oh, well. I've been too busy talking about tight ends and Matt Rule's godfather Corleone strategy. Hey, we at least <laughs> stayed around football this, this show. We did. That's good. No <laughs> Japanese baseball. <laughs> we still so, have time. Good stuff, man. Appreciate really appreciate you. you. Really appreciate you guys. And again, Hail Varsity Radio, four to six. And check them out on Saturday morning. Honestly, I was gonna I was it's gonna fun. list off the uh, the radio stations. It doesn't matter. Find us online, find us on a radio station. There's a lot of places for it. <laughs> appreciate everybody. Turn into bigger junkies as well. These guys are great. Subscribe if this is your first time listening. And this may be the most unbelievable night in Cornester football history.